The Watership Down podcast is intended for listeners who are familiar with the plot. There will be spoilers. This episode is scripted, recorded, edited and narrated by Newell Fisher. Hello and welcome to the Watership Down podcast episode 138 in which we will be looking at season 2 episode 1 of the TV series and episode 14 of the series overall. The first episode of season 2, Prisoner of Ephrafa. I'm still showcasing Watership Down themed art, details in the notes. Please let me know if you would like your Watership Down themed art to appear as the podcast title image for an episode, with full credit given. Just a couple of thoughts after last week's visit to the site of Ephrafa at the Crickson uh, near Overton in Hampshire. First of all, my apologies for the poor focus at times at the start. This is an issue my phone seems to have. Oddly enough, I actually like the slightly industrial setting near Overton Station at the start, as it seemed a reflection of the representation of Ephrafa that I talked about in episode 136 two weeks ago. You may have noticed in the YouTube version that my reading at the Crickson was heavily edited. This was because the sound quality wasn't really good enough. My external mic options at the moment aren't really adequate, and I am looking at ways of improving this. If you do want to see the entire reading, it is available on the YouTube channel as a one-off extra. Link in the notes. I'm also sorry if I disappointed anyone by not following the route of the flight to the test. I've decided this should be done with the permission of the relevant landowners, which will take a little time. Watch this space. Next, I've just received my copy of the Watership Down graphic novel, adapted and illustrated by James Sturm and Joe Sutfin, which I have, of course, already read cover to cover. Initial impressions? A beautifully illustrated work that is the first visual version of Watership Down to be entirely uninfluenced by the 1978 film. It entirely goes back to the original source material. The the chapter structure almost echoes the book, and while the plot, and especially the words of the characters, are inevitably summarised, it is faithful to the original, though with its own emphases and embellishments of the original plot at very interesting moments, and any changes to the original words of the characters are very forgivable. Does it miss out elements I wish it hadn't? Yes, it does. I particularly miss Rabscuttle, who is entirely absent. Then again, Bluebell is represented better than ever before since the original novel was published. There are chapters in the novel that simply do not lend themselves to a graphic novel, and they are dealt with briefly and appropriately. All in all, though, a beautiful representation of the original story, though one that will make most sense, to be honest, to those who are already familiar with it. Anyway, let's start Season 2 of the 1999-2001 to TV series. Season 2, Episode 1, Prisoner of Ephrafa. The 14th episode of the Watership Down TV series was first broadcast in the UK on the 8th of August 2000, about seven and a half months after the previous episode. It was written by Mary Crawford and Alan Templeton. There will be a link to the episode in the notes. The YouTube channel I am using for the episodes has had to change as the previous source has become unavailable. And welcome to the Alza, Remy Mydent, on the Facebook group Watership Down Fans, for finding this new source of visual flayra. I will retrospectively update the notes from Season 1 when I have the time. Meanwhile, the link for the full playlist will be in the notes. More generally, this highlights the difficulty in accessing film versions of Watership Down, with the 2018 Netflix version being the only one that is easily available. I don't think this is acceptable. Yes, I know that these works are the intellectual property of those who made them, but if there are people who want to see them and are prepared to pay to do so, why make their only option buying second-hand DVD copies? Make them available for online streaming and start making some money out of them. After all, isn't that why they were made originally? This is an issue I'm going to come back to, because it has been annoying me for some time. Meanwhile, I'm happy to pass on any tips for watching film versions of Warship Down online in different parts of the world that I may receive. Obviously, I urge you to use paying options, but what if those simply aren't available? Anyway. The first episode of Season 2 of the TV series opens with a repeat of the scene that closed Season 1, as Vervain shouts his ultimatum to the rabbits of Watership Down from atop the ruined stone bridge. Hazel, Bigwig and Fiverr have until the moon is round to give themselves up, or they will never see Pipkin alive again. Bigwig turns to Hazel, and they look up at the crescent moon. 
Cut to watership down at night, and the moon is nearly full, so presumably a week has passed. Yet a meeting is taking place in the honeycomb in which Bigwig is letting everyone know what is meant to happen, seemingly for the first time. Weird. Blackberry says they cannot give themselves up, even if it means losing Pipkin. She looks sad. She was with Pipkin when he was swept away in the river. Hannah the Mouse is shocked, but both Broom and Hawkbit agree that they cannot lose the three most important rabbits in Watership Down. Hannah challenges Hawkbit before Hazel butts in to say they are not giving up on anyone. He reminds them that they have a secret ally in Afrafa, Campion. In Afrafa, Vervain has been given the job of providing the captain, a captive Pipkin with Flayra. He doesn't seem to be enjoying the job. Pipkin stares at him as he eats. Irritably, Vervain asks why. Pipkin informs Vervain that he isn't as ugly as Kihar says he is. Pipkin might not be the sharpest tool in the box, but you have to admire his bravery. An indignant Vervain raises a paw ready to strike Pipkin, saying he needs a lesson in manners, but he is interrupted by Woundwort, who asks if he needs a lesson in obedience. The raised paw pats Pipkin on the head. Vervain leaves awkwardly. Woundwort settles down next to Pipkin, ready to play the kindly uncle. But Pipkin just asks him if he is going to let him go. Woundwort says he must be missing his parents, to which Pipkin responds he doesn't have a mother and father. A weasel got them both. This is new information from the young Pipkin of this series, and it triggers the trauma in Woundwort as the disjointed music we heard in episode 5 plays again, and again we see the flashback to when Woundwort lost his mother as she sacrificed herself to a weasel to save him. Pipkin sympathises with Woundwort, who leaves immediately, though still playing nice. You sense he finds sympathy difficult to deal with. Campion appears and tells Woundwort he is returning to duty. As he does, a strange, quiet phrase is heard, spoken by an unfamiliar voice that says, like killing a part of myself. Is this a strange reference to Campion's inner turmoil, or was it an editing error? Campion talks to Moss, who is guarding Pipkin. Moss tells Campion about the ultimatum to Watership Down. When Moss says he isn't looking forward to possibly having to kill Pipkin, Campion covers his shot by reprimanding him that he will follow orders, then leaves. The bluff works. Moss comments to his fellow guard that Campion isn't as pleasant as he thought. On Watership Down, the rabbits are discussing what to do above ground. Hawkbit suggests Cap capturing Vervain and exchanging him for Pipkin, but Bigwig says it wouldn't work on Woundwort. Nearby, Hannah and Kihar are listening. Hannah comments to Kihar that the rabbits fight their wars and think it is only their business. Well, it kind of is, isn't it? How do rabbit affairs really affect other wildlife, apart from the occasional fox killed by the Afrafans in this version? However, <clears throat> Pipkin is also Hannah and Kihar's friend, and as a result, the theme in Watership Down of enlisting the help of other animals is about to take a severe turn towards a more Disney-like approach. Hannah jumps on Kihar's back, and they set off. They arrive first at a molehill, where Hannah tells a resident that Pipkin is in trouble. The mole seems concerned. It is late now, and the Watership Down leadership are still trying to come up with ideas to save Pipkin. Bigwig is advocating military tactics that Hazel says will not work against Woundwort. This frustrates Bigwig. Fiverr suggests they rest, but Bigwig points out that they are running out of time. At this point, a bat arrives, hangs from a tree branch, introduces himself as Darkling, and says he has heard about Pipkin from Hannah. He has come to help. Hazel tries to be polite, but Bigwig asks what one, one bat is supposed to do. Darkling giggles, and the rest of the bats arrive. A lot of them. Back at Ephrafa, it is daytime, and Pitkin is having fun with his new toy, Vervain. While sitting on Woundwort's podium, he tells Vervain to hop on one leg and bar like a sheep. Woundwort, always happy to see Vervain humiliated, tells Pipkin he has a flair for command. Pipkin says it doesn't seem that difficult. With this Pipkin, it begins, can be difficult to distinguish between genuine naivety and cunning. Is he fully aware that Vervain is only obeying because of Woundwort? Or am I over-analysing this children's animation? Vervain tells Campion he can't keep this up. Acting nice to badger spawn such as Pipkin is not in his nature. Campion asks permission to check the guard. 
They need to be ready for the enemy. He stares at Pipkin as he says that word and then bows and leaves. Woundwalt says to Pipkin that he could be a captain in his Owsler one day, just like Campion of Vervain. But Pipkin responds that he'd rather be like Hazel and Bigwig. He'd follow them anywhere, even to the end of the world. Vervain breaks character, saying mockingly that every rabbit in Ephrafa would follow the general, even into the lair of the black rabbit. Pipkin responds that they would only do so out of fear. It's not the same. Vervain is outraged. He starts telling Pipkin to show the general the proper respect, but Woundwort bellows at him to leave. When he protests, Woundwort threatens to kill him, kind of proving Pipkin's point. As Vervain scuttles away, Woundwort asks Pipkin why he isn't afraid. Pipkin says he is. He's afraid that Woundwort will find out where their warren is, that he will hurt his friends. Woundwort says he hides it very well. Pipkin responds that Bigwig says he should use his fear to make him stronger. He looks at Woundwort and says that's why he is so strong. Woundwort also gets scared. Woundwort does not take offence at this. He admits it is true. Fear is part of every rabbit's life. It, it makes them who they are. The discordant music starts again as we see a close-up on Woundwort's white eye. In it we see a reflection of an aggressive cat. And now it is the eye of the young Woundwort. We see him in a small cage being menaced by the cat. A human hand opens the cage and drops food on his head. For the first time, the young Woundwort looks angry. He starts chewing at the wire of his cage. Back in the present, Woundwort tells Pipkin he escaped. That his fear of man made him capable of doing anything he dreamed of. He says man has the ability to shape the world. But in Ephrafa, he is the power. Pipkin says that everyone is afraid of him. Is that what he really wants? At this, Woundwalk bridles and tells Pipkin to go back to his chamber. He has finally hit too close to home. Above ground, Campion checks the coast is clear before moving into a wooded area. Vervain watches him from the stone bridge with moss. They follow. In the wood, Campion leaves a light-coloured pebble between two roots of a tree. Vervain finds the pebble and comments that Campion hasn't been the same since he met the outsiders. No wonder, comments Moss, after the beating he received. But Vervain is convinced Campion is up to something. I guess leaving pebbles under trees is the main clue on this occasion. Vervain says they will pick up his trail. They follow Campion. Back on Watership Down, most of local wildlife has turned up to help. Above ground, Blackberry tries to supervise while in the honeycomb, Dandelion tries to organise the various species into groups. This is pure Disney. The leadership look on with Hannah and Kiha. It seems Kit Pipkin is very popular with all creatures that aren't a lil. Bigwig seems happy, and Hazel says they know the plan. Time to get on with it. He will contact Campion. And now we learn the meaning of the pebble under the tree from Bigwig. It means Campion wants to meet right away. Hazel leaves. Bigwig complains that Hazel has taken the dangerous job leaving Bigwig to organise the rabble. He shouts for quiet. We see all manner of creatures fall silent in shock. There are teams to organise. The special digging teams consist of moles, voles, water voles and muskrats. As a quick aside, muskrats are, are a North American species that has been introduced to Europe, but not, according to Wikipedia, to Britain, where the only population that did get established was eliminated. But here we are still in this straight twilight, strange twilight world, again very Disney-like, that is a kind of combined Britain and North America. We leave Bigwig to find Hazel running through the secret caves. He emerges by the river and makes his way straight to the tree where he finds the signal pebble. In a clearing nearby, Campion greets him in a friendly manner. He reassures Hazel that Pipkin is fine, but there is no way they will get him out and there's very little he can do to help. Hazel says not to underestimate them. Campion agrees he shouldn't. Hazel adds that he won't have to help them, and he will show Campion what he means. At a field nearby, Hazel says that this is where Woundwort wants to make the exchange. How has he been told this? Hazel says that Woundwort must come through a gap in a stone wall and make his way to a beech tree. Campion says he can make sure that happens. Hazel adds that Woundwalk must go no further than the tree, that is vital, and Pipkin must be warned to be ready to run. Something is clearly on Campion's mind. He says he looked at his reflection in a pond and it wasn't him anymore. He was looking at a traitor. 
Hazel says he has chosen a dangerous trail. It is one he must travel alone. Hazel knows how hard that is. They are interrupted by Vervain shouting for Campion. He really is an idiot. I mean, if he wants to catch him out, why shout? Or have Vervain's tracking skills let him down? Hazel hesitates a bit too long, out in the open before leaving, just as Vervain emerges from a bush. Him and Moss find Campion sniffing a scent. Vervain is sure he heard him talking to someone. Campion denies this. He says he has picked up Hazel's track, but it is an old one. He leads them away from the hiding Hazel. At Ephrafa, Woundwort is showing off to Pipkin by fighting three Owlslaw at once. He asks if Hazel could do as well. Pipkin says he couldn't, but would, wouldn't need to. Hazel thinks his way out of trouble. Woundwort responds sarcastically. At the entrance to the secret river, Hazel meets Bigwig and Fiverr and confirms he met Campion. They are all set. He asks how Bigwig got on. Bigwig says that if he shouts loud enough, he can organise raindrops. He turns and orders the diggers to move out. The rescue of Pipkin has begun. They cross the stream, for the secret river entrance now lies on the side stream again, apparently, and along with the digging party make their way to the field where the exchange is supposed to happen. Hazel comments that tonight is the full moon. They have one chance to get this right. Big Week says that's all they need. At Ephrafa, Woundwort and Pipkin sit on the root, a root of the dead tree as Woundwort explains that he built Ephrafa. When he arrived, it was a small and vulnerable warren. The Alil were everywhere. He changed that. He gave them discipline, order and safety. He could do the same for Pipkin's warren if he tells them where to find it. Pipkin says he can't. Campion, Moss and Vervain arrive. The perimeter is secure. Vervain suggests preparing for the prisoner exchange. Pipkin asks what this means. He is horrified by Woundwalk's explanation and makes a run for it, dodging Vervain, then Moss. Campion catches hold of him and tries to reassure him. Woundwalk says Pipkin can end all this by telling him where his warren is. Pipkin, scared, desperate and held by Campion, tells Woundwalk that he doesn't have to fight any more. He isn't in a cage. He doesn't have to be afraid. Woundwalk ignores him and tells Campion to take Pipkin underground. Campion scruffs Pipkin in his mouth and takes him away. The first time we have seen a young rabbit carried in this way. At the entrance to Ephrafa, Campion drops Pipkin and tells him he is a friend. Vervain asks Woundwalk for the honour of killing Pipkin himself if Hazel doesn't show up. He is smiling. Absent-mindedly, Woundwalk says that would be like killing a part of himself. He tells Vervain he will deal with Pipkin if it comes to it. Vervain looks disappointed. Clearly Woundwort does not want Pipkin's death to be as painful as Vervain would make it, because there was a time when he was Pipkin. The same probably cannot be said of the sadist Vervain. In a strange scene to the accompaniment of light, cheerful music, Fiverr is seen apparently supervising a digging party on the riverbank. Meanwhile, Bigwig is supervising digging in the field where the exchange is meant to happen. Fiver spots an FF and patrol and warns Bigwig, who takes cover along with the diggers just in time. It is night time at FF. Woundwort emerges from the entrance to see the full moon. Time is up. The FF and Owsler, with Pipkin, head for the exchange field. We see Kihar rapidly flying and hear a mass of flying creatures. He cries out that it is almost time to be there. At the field, the Afrafans move through the gap in the stone wall. The watership down rabbits are at the beech tree. Bigwig says the Afrafans aren't taking any chances. Fiverr comments that this is what the watership down rabbits usually do. Hazel says Woundwort is off the path. He may step in the trap too early and it will all be over. But Campion joins Woundwort to get him back on the desired line. Hazel, Bigwig and Fiverr breathe a sigh of relief. The Afrafans stop. Woundwort urges Pipkin forward. He reaches Hazel, who tells him to follow their tracks exactly. Pipkin says he doesn't want to leave them. A furious Hazel fixes him with a campion-like glare and tells him to do as he is told, now. Woundwort shouts to Hazel to surrender. He cannot escape. Hazel says that is what the fox said to Elara, this series' shortened name for Elachrara. He smiles and looks up as a horde of bats and birds led by Kihar descend on the Afrafans. Woundwort orders them to hold their formations and attack. Immediately, the advancing Afrafans fall into holes concealed in the field. Campion, smiling to himself, 
falls into the same hole as Mervain, landing on him heavily. Woundwort looks on furiously. He makes straight for the warship down rabbits. The moles clustered round the beech tree complete their task and it, as it begins to fall. Woundwort turns back, but it is too late. The tree falls on him. Hazel looks on grimly. He takes no pleasure in this. Bigwig approaches the trapped Woundwort. He tells him the war is over and he has lost. He raises a paw. But Pipkin is suddenly between them, defending Woundwort. Hazel shouts it is too late and to run. The Afrafans are emerging from the traps. Pipkin says to Woundwort that war isn't the way. The trapped Woundwort replies that it is the only way he knows. As the rabbits of watership down the street, Woundwort's words echo on under the full moon. Kihar waves farewell to his flying comrades. But Bigwig is furious with Pipkin. Hazel points out that Woundwort would have killed them. But Pipkin points out that they are not like him. Fiverr agrees. There is a general nodding of heads. Under the full moon, they follow Kihar back to Watership Down. Is it canon? Obviously not. In fact, I'm increasingly tempted to rename this segment, but it's become a bit of a running theme, so we'll stick with it for now. The relative darkness of the last episode of season one contrasts with the disnification of this one, as the theme of cooperation with other wildlife is taken to what one might call a ridiculous extreme. However, the brief foray into Woundwart's backstory is well portrayed and quite close to the book in some ways. Overall, though, this episode takes a firm step further in, dire in the direction of the ethics of children's animation, especially with Pipkin's intervention at the end to save Woundwort. Call me an old cynic, but I would have let Bigwig carry on. Tragic though Woundwort's backstory is, he is a rabbit who is only too happy to create many more tragic backstories, and the modicum of self-awareness he is granted in this episode does not appear to offer any chance of redemption for him. I guess this goes to the very heart of issues around pacifism, the virtues of which should probably always have a place in any work of fiction aimed at children. Better to teach compassion and bloodlust to the young. But a wound wart is still a wound wart. Next time we begin a three-episode break from Ephrafa, with a roundabout return to the Warren of the Shining Wires. Mm -hmm.